Moore. Here. Alderman Candelian. Here. Alderman Tack. Here. Alderman Reisenberg. Here. Alderman Palmer. Here. Alderman Edelman is here. Mr. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you, Betty. Would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on the agenda this evening is reports of city officers, and th that first section is comments by mayor, and I do have a couple of things this evening. Um, tonight, we are honored to have a great group of folks with us, the uh, Recreation Department High School Sailing Team, who is this year's Great Lakes High School Sailing Champs, and was received the number one ranking in the Midwest Interscholastic Sailing Association. And this is not just the first year, this is multiple years. They have a tremendous history of success. Uh, and I'd love to see if Hunter Ratliff could come up and say a couple words and talk about the program. Hunter? Honorable Mayor, members of the council, I would like to uh, thank each and every one of you for having us this evening. Um, when I came to the Lake Forest Sailing Program back in 2005, uh, we had four sailors on the high school team. This past fall, we had 42 sailors on the team. The high school sailing program has grown beyond anything that I could ever have imagined when I got here in 2005. <clears throat> this group of young athletes with skills ranging from complete novice to the seasoned lifelong sailor is one of the most talented groups that I've ever had the pleasure of working with. To say that they are dedicated would be an understatement. They do not sacrifice what they want most for what they want most at the time. And they make a commitment to their commitments. Their dedication to train in all, and trust me, I mean all weather conditions, <laughs> uh, is, is the reason that they have success. It's not uncommon to sail in 20 knots with 35 degree air temperature and 35 degree water temperature with a snowy, wintry mix falling upon them. In this group of sailors, they don't complain about this, uh, this weather that they can't control. Nope, they put on another layer, they put their boat in the water, and they continue to develop their skills. And that's why they're the number one ranked team in the Midwest. And that's against 53 other registered schools in six states. And that's, that discipline is why they won the Great Lakes Championship this fall. And that they found themselves on the podium at the national championship out in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. And that's why they found themselves on the podium out at the United, the United States Coast Guard Academy. The results are, are impressive. But what impresses me even more is their commitment to the Corinthian spirit and their sportsmanship, not only on the water, but also off the water. And this is what separates the Lake, the Lake Forest Sailing Program from other teams and other programs around. And I know that that success on the water will be transferable to anything that they want to go on to accomplish <coughs> later on in life. And without the support of the city of Lake Forest and the Lake Forest Recreation Department, it would not be possible. And we thank you for your continued support. Honorable Mayor, members of the council, I present to you the uh, Lake Forest Sailing Program from the fall of 2013. With uh, Connor Kennehan, why don't you uh, come on up? Uh, uh, we have uh, Justin Frank, come on. Uh, Brittany Manning. Catherine Jones. John Michael Eckert. Sarah Porter. William Curtis and Malcolm Lamphere.
We're also welcomed um, by my uh, program assistant, uh, Brian Panier, as well. We'll have him come up. Some of us won't be anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I still will be. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll make it. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations on a great year. We're very proud of you and certainly very proud of these great young men and women. The city is very proud of you. Thank you. Uh, next item, I just wanted to mention we had a terrific uh, tree lighting ceremony at Market Square on Friday evening. Uh, according to the chief, it may have been record numbers, and I can take no credit for that. It was all about the weather. Uh, but we had a great group, and I would ask everybody again to uh, make sure when you have the chance to dine locally, shop locally. We have terrific merchants, great restaurateurs in town. They are eager to serve you with great service and great products. So when you have an opportunity now that Cyber Monday is over uh, and you can hit the shops, please do so in Lake Forest. Uh, those are the conclusion of my comments. Next item on the agenda, comments by City Manager. Bob Kiley. <coughs> I might need some staff assistance to help me on these overheads, but we'll see. Uh, first, let me say, um, on behalf of the city staff, we wish everyone a very happy holiday. I needed to say that to explain why I'm wearing this tie, because this is our only uh, Christmas or only meeting prior to Christmas, so I wanted to make sure I at least wore it once before uh, I put it back in the closet till next year. Oh, let's see here now. Earlier this morning, the Shared Fire Service Task Force met, and just as a refresher, the Shared Fire Service Task Force is comprised of two representatives from Lake Forest, Lake Bluff, Highwood, and Highland Park. <coughs> And we met this morning to continue conversation, the dialogue with respect to centralized dispatch for 911 operations. This is something that we have been studying for approximately a year. And uh, just again as a reminder that on Tuesday, December 17th at 7 p.m. at the Highland Park Country Club, we're having a joint meeting of uh, Lake Bluff, Lake Forest, and Highland Park who have dispatching operations to review the final report from the consultant on the uh, advantages and the cost implications <coughs> of looking at um, a centralized dispatching operation rather than three independent dispatching operations. The meeting this morning was um, an opportunity for the committee members to hear updated financial information from uh, the consultant, and I believe you all have copies in front of you if it's a little hard to, uh, <coughs> to read this, and I probably should, this is probably the more relevant information. Everybody always likes to go to the bottom line still, um, but in, you can't read it. Uh, the potential uh, five-year savings for the city of Lake Forest is approximately 1.9, oh, that much easier to read, is approximately $1.9 million under what is um, option 4B, where uh, the committee really came down to two options. Option three would be a consolidation in the city of Highland Park at their current facility. Option 4B, which was the preferred option of the group, was uh, <coughs> 
dispatching operations through the village of Glenview with a backup facility or what's called a redundant facility in the city of Highland Park. And the benefit of having that is really the opportunity that if a disaster were to occur, that you could switch quickly switch over and it would almost appear seamless and in terms of being able to continue emergency dispatch operations without any loss of service. Some of the examples uh, uh, that uh, actually Alderman Palmer asked the question this morning at the meeting of, you know, give us some examples of when this might occur. And it might be if someone was to bring in a package into a dispatching operation, which tends to be located in a public safety building, you have to evacuate the building, you have to shut down your dispatching operations. Or you might have a telecommunication line coming into a dispatching operation that gets cut by a contractor or something like that. These are some examples of situations around the country where dispatching operations have gone down. So there's some real benefits to that, and I won't go into any great detail tonight because we'll be talking about that in more detail on the 17th. But I did want to brief the, uh, the council. This is where we're at right now. Um, I think there's a number of uh, operational considerations, both pro and con, and there was a lot of discussion today about what does it mean to service levels because that clearly, I think, is the trade-off of, yeah, it's nice to save $1.9 million, but what are going to be the impacts on service levels that residents can expect? And how, to the extent that we can, do we minimize those impacts so it's as seamless as possible and has as little impact as possible? And we'll go through that in much more detail on the 17th. But I did want to brief the council this evening that the conversation continues to move forward and really encourage everybody to be in attendance <coughs> on the 17th. Uh, in Highland Park. I'll be happy to answer any other questions or Alderman Palmer if you had anything you wanted to add that I did not mention here. All I would say is this task force has really beat up the issue. I think it's, it's looked at it from every possible way and uh, even if we go with this that that doesn't mean we won't have people at the station. Um, we'll have some sort of administrative people there anyway um, and even if the station is closed at a certain time, as opposed to being a 24-7 station, uh, we were talking about having some facility where if you have an emergency and you get there and you hit a button, there'll be a police car that gets there within three minutes. I mean, cars are all, always over, and it's not like the police department is going home. They're just out on <coughs> patrol, and, and they can get to the station in an instant. So, you know, we're not going to do anything that's going to endanger our populace. Right. You know, I think it's a valid point. I'm sorry to interrupt. I think it's a valid point because I think right now there is a perception that there is a police officer in that building 24-7, and that's really not the case. There's a body, uh, but more times than not, it's the dispatcher that uh, will let you into an enclosed area, but then will dispatch an officer to come in and, and to meet with you. So uh, right. that D Dispatchers are not armed. The d dispatchers are not armed, and they're behind protective glass. And, if something really bad happens, they're likely not going to come out from behind that protective glass. I'm sorry, Alderman Moore. Yeah, uh, just to, looking at the numbers, they're disproportionate relative to costs and savings. And why is that? Why does Lake Bluff save 50% and we save 35% and so on and so forth? Some of it has to do with uh, current um, um, population count, if you will, of how many um, employees you have. Uh, you know, we contract with Lake Bluff uh, to a certain extent right now. They have some dispatching during the days. We dispatch <clears throat> for the evenings and weekends. Uh, also, there's a capital cost consideration that's factored in here as well that might be playing into it. And then the third item has to do with these costs do reflect that if we were to dispatch out, we would probably hire back a couple additional positions to do what we call ancillary or non-emergency calls for service. So if you called and you wanted to know what time does the parade start today, there's somebody there that can answer that question or handle uh, traffic tickets or do some other record uh, keeping work that's necessary for the police department. So it really depends on staffing levels of how you're going to continue to provide that <coughs> service going forward. But reflective of increased service then is what you're exactly. saying. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because really when you take a look at it, there's there's two main components to the cost structure here. It's personnel costs and capital costs. And part of this is the idea is that you're you're looking at economies of scale for uh, on the personnel side 
And I think right now between those four communities, we have 21 uh, dispatchers between the four communities. We would go down to 12 through the economies of scale. Um, and on the capital side, you're spreading that capital cost among four municipalities rather than each individual municipality having to incur those costs. Bob, so. I'm looking at page two in the first matrix right column says potential annual savings to Lake Forest is 228,248. And then when you come down to the last line, the five year savings doesn't tie out to that. If you divide five into the million 895, it's more like an annual savings of 379,015. <coughs> Correct. The, uh, the potential annual savings is just on the operating side, so you would have to then factor in the additional capital cost savings, which I believe is on, uh, go to uh, page one, the uh, second. Um, there are the $444,000. Uh huh. So. That would be what five times two hundred and twenty five is a million. So yeah, it's it only adds up to a million six or so. But I don't have my calculator in front of me. It's a good question. Yeah, I'm just confused from the annual savings to the five year savings, how why the it doesn't reconcile. And in any event, if it's yeah. the higher number, it comes out to about 60, just under $60 a household. Yeah. And I only mention that in the context of, I haven't any, had any residents say to me, oh yeah, go for this shared services thing. And I probably had a couple handfuls of people say, don't do it, we'll regret it, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> that's not really a test of the <clears throat> marketplace because that's maybe a dozen folks. Yeah. And I would say that I probably received, uh, or the city received, um, probably a dozen to two dozen. Most of the inquiries were, how will this impact me if I dial 911? And I think that's a very legitimate issue and one that we're going to have to address. And I think we've talked it through at the committee level, but I think we'll have to talk about it more publicly because, as I've expressed to some people, um, you know, this is going to be focused on emergency calls and what people don't realize is that right now our dispatchers are having handling both emergency and non-emergency calls so if you call up and you ask about well, what time is the parade at they're dealing with that call when alderman palmer might be calling with a true emergency mm -hmm. so i mean there are some pluses and minuses that have to be looked at and i think that's you know one of the issues that we'll have to sort through following the 17th because after the presentation on the 17th then we probably will be bringing this back sometime in the first quarter of 2014 for the council to really evaluate is this something we want to move forward with also an interesting thing that's come out is with the increasing usage of cell phones they go to cell phone towers <clears throat> and they may not even go to the 911 in your community so yeah so they're not going to know when the parade starts <laughs> they're not going to know when the parade starts, and they're not going to know where you are other than somewhere near a cell phone tower. That's right. Yeah. Um, any other questions for Bob? Any other questions on that? <clears throat> the uh, next item under my agenda, and Kathy, I'm going to have to ask you to help me uh, move to the PowerPoint. <laughs> Thank you. Well, certainly, as the mayor knows, because he was at the ribbon cutting ceremony, but uh, wanted to mention to the council and the community that the uh, Route 41 access to the Lake Forest Northwestern Hospital complex is officially open, open prior to the Thanksgiving holiday. And um, we had, in anticipation, of the opening of the new access road. We've been monitoring traffic counts both before and after. So hopefully 
with uh, over a period of time we'll have some good data in terms of how much traffic hopefully this is diverting off of the uh, the deer path and the uh, uh, 41 intersection there this is a shot of the same intersection looking east uh, from the access road coming on to to Westmoreland there uh, this evening I um, am pleased to have with us uh, the chairman of the ad hoc task force that was put in place. Council will recall that when we approved the hospital, we recognized that this was a very technical and potentially um, uh, long-term uh, discussion that the community was going to have as the hospital prepared its plans. And knowing that this really uh, was something that it was of utmost importance to the community as it looked forward to its build out, we put this task force in place to really bring together some expertise that did not exist on any single bo board or body that we had in the city to work with the hospital hand in glove to come up with the best plan uh, going forward. I'm pleased, uh, you know, every now and then when you have these thoughts and ideas of doing this, you're always wondering, is this going to work out? Uh, but uh, I think this is a good example of where you put good people in place and then get out of their way and let them do their job, uh, that the final product uh, is really a positive thing. This evening, uh, the chairman of the committee, Ed Chandler, is here, who is <coughs> going to give you a much more comprehensive report than I ever could on all the work the committee has done, because the committee has met nine times uh, since it was put in place about a year ago to tonight. And I think you'll see from some of the, uh, the renderings and where the hospital started and where they are today of the hard work that the committee has done. And if Tom McAfee was here, I think he would even admit that the uh, project is in a much better place today than it was a year ago due to the hard work and input of the uh, nine member task force. So Ed, if I could ask you to come forward and Thanks, Bob. Uh, Your Honor, Council Members, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's been, uh, I will say, a great pleasure to be involved in this uh, committee. I, uh, I, I have the honor of being the chairman of this committee, but as Bob says, the committee is stacked with people who, who uh, are experts, and I'm not one of them. So uh, for me, it's, it's been a learning process, both from the hospital and from, and from my fellow committee members. Uh, this is an important project, clearly, uh, the, the, the hospital uh, renovation uh, redevelopment is, uh, represents perhaps the, the most important, well, certainly the largest, maybe the second largest enterprise within, our, within the city borders, uh, second only maybe to the Lake Forest College. And, um, and beyond that, uh, its, it's uh, value to the, to, the, to the city for many years in its old form and I think going forward in its new form is, is, is critical. So, um, uh, so when Bob asked me to, to, to do this, I was uh, both flattered and, and, and pleased to, to participate. Um, the, the committee members, uh, aside from me, is there a button I can push? Great. Um, You'll recognize several names, if not all, on this list. Uh, it really is a, a, a phenomenal group of, uh, of people representing a, a great depth of talent. Craig Bergman, uh, Jeffrey Gannon, Charles Kohlmeyer, uh, Stephen Wright, Rafael Carrera, Susan Garrett, John Centel, and Augie Ziccarelli. A, a nice diverse uh, group of expertise. Um, uh, from engineers to, to architects to, uh, to people who understand the, the pulse of the, uh, of the community. Um, it's been, a, a, as I say, a great pleasure to work with them. Uh, we were formed in January uh, by, by Bob and um, have been meet, re meeting regularly, basically monthly, uh, since our first meeting with the hospital in February. Nine meetings in all, typically a couple hours uh, in each of these meetings. So a significant amount of time has been put in both by the committee and by the hospital, uh, by the hospital uh, group. The project, uh, I, I would say, from from our first um, from our first discussions with the hospital has evolved um, really quite dramatically. Um, uh, hopefully for the better. 
uh, but certainly um, the plans as they've as they've gotten more detailed have been refined and they've been refined in a way that we think is has has moved them in a positive direction uh, there but that said the the plans from the committee's point of view uh, remain consistent with the uh, with the original approved master plan uh, the advisory committee process has been full of discussion with the hospital. I'm not sure I'd agree with Bob that uh, Tom would, would say that he's uh, in favor or enjoyed this much, but, uh, but I would say that, that um, uh, perhaps other members of the staff would, would, would say so. And uh, certainly from our point of view, we think that the, that the process has been productive. Um, and. Uh, at this point, I guess, I'm not really gonna to be too comprehensive. I'll be glad to answer questions. I would say that the committee is at this point ready to forward recommendations to the plan commission with regard to uh, key significant large aspects of the, of the, of the, of the development plans. Uh, we would suggest at this point conditions, with some conditions, uh, approval of uh, the overall site plan for the hospital, the architectural design of the building, um, exterior lighting plan and preliminary landscape concepts. Uh, but there is more work to do uh, as, as the hospital team gets into further details on uh, particularly how open space on the campus will be preserved in perpetuity, which, is, which was uh, detailed or at least um, called for in the, in the uh, master plan. Uh, we'll see detailed landscaping plans, which we haven't seen yet. And the signage plan, which is an aspect of the of the overall project, which um, goes beyond, if you will, the the uh, hospital campus itself, and and begins to touch into the into into its uh, boundaries and the environs of the city outside that campus. So, those things are are ongoing. I, I guess there are a couple of slides here. Um, just a just a, a couple of things. This is the current site plan as conceived by the. Uh, uh, by the hospital team, as you can see, the 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 um, uh, they, they've done some very interesting and innovative uh, uh, things with the with the site uh, to accommodate the water uh, retention requirements. Uh, they're looking at expanded but naturally uh, landscape pond to the east, uh, bordered by a more ornamental and um, engineered pond. Uh, close in to the to the new buildings uh, and on the west at least in after this uh, first phase there will be significant um, open open land uh, still still remaining on the site uh, the ag field if you will if you if you're familiar with the site there's a there's a cornfield uh, which is going to remain a cornfield at least initially uh, on the far on the far left one difference between the original uh, concept and this is that the parking in this um, in this plan in the current plan would actually stay as surface parking uh, with permeable surfaces uh, for uh, for water management, but uh, without a parking garage, uh, there are really two reasons for that. The uh, the, the the practical reason uh, is that it makes for better flexibility on the site going forward, and then in the um, uh, the aesthetic reason is that, as you'll see, uh, you, uh, as we go into this, uh, the viewscape uh, into the into the new buildings, which um, should look quite good, uh, are not as are not blocked if the if the if the um, parking is on the ground. And that's just um, uh, an elevation from the east, uh, essentially from 41, uh, looking toward the toward the new buildings as they're as they're uh, being conceived um, again uh, quite if if any of you were familiar with what was being talked about <laughs> early on this is a quite dramatic difference from from that and that's all i've got anything else questions for ed you know it's beautiful not my not my job i would say that the hospital team is really you know they picked fantastic architects and they've picked a, a terrific team of, of uh, landscape architects and engineers, and th you know they're doing the job right. And um, uh, we should be we should be very pleased that that Northwestern has taken it upon themselves to build a world class uh, regional hospital, you know, here uh, in, in our in our borders. Ed, I'd like to take the opportunity to to publicly thank you and your committee. I'd 
I know you, you downplayed the, the time you spent. I, I was at the first couple of meetings. Uh, I, I know, as you mentioned earlier, where we started versus where we are is dramatic. Well, Donald, you, and, man, and it, very uh, nice to a say great so, deal of that has to do uh, to the work and the effort and really the commitment that your team has made. And, and I want to publicly thank Kathy Cerniak, too. I mean, it, it, I think they have worked, all of you have worked very closely with the hospital. Uh, and I, I can tell you that in talking to Tom McAfee, he is thrilled Good. with where things are headed. They couldn't be more excited. And, and I think we as a community uh, all feel the same way, that to have a world-class hospital in this community will be a tremendous thing. And uh, it's, it's really taken shape and form that is an exciting thing to see. So on behalf of the community, we want to thank you and your committee a great deal. Okay. Questions? Any other, Fred? You're off the hook. Thanks, Fred. <laughs> Thanks. That completes my report. Thanks, Bob. Next item on the agenda, comments by council members uh, on the Finance Committee, uh, com consideration of an ordinance, restarting and reaffirming the ordinance number 2008-08 and an ordinance establishing the 2013 tax levy grant final approval presented by Elizabeth Holub, Finance Director. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Um, these two ordinances did receive first reading approval on November 18th. They are before you this evening for final reading and final approval. Um, the first, uh, the ordinance restating and reaffirming ordinance number 2008-08, again, um, has three um, revisions to it. Um, the first two affect the debt service levy. Um, the first adjusting the debt se um, service levy limit to allow for that to be adjusted um, by an inflationary factor to recognize that the cost of capital improvements increase over time rather than having a static limit as set in 2004. Uh, the second, uh, also impacting the debt service levy, but to recommend that this um, debt service levy cap be revised to allow the cap to apply to the sum of any debt service levy plus any capital improvements line item in the levy should the council um, choose to do so at a later time. It allows the flexibility for pay-as-you-go financing to avoid interest costs and reduce the overall cost of capital improvements. The city doesn't do that now, but we wanted to take this opportunity to allow the council that opportunity going forward if they did, chose to do so in the future. And the third change would impact the aggregate levy. It would provide under, uh, under specific circumstances um, the city council's ability to exceed the property tax cap. The exception would require three-fourths vote. This has been revised um, based on the discussion on November 18th from two-thirds to three-fourths vote of the city council. Could not be more than 5% and must be used for either capital improvements or replacement of revenue loss due to the state altering its distribution of funds allocated to local governments. So that is the first ordinance uh, subject to your consideration. The second is the tax levy ordinance. I will not go through each of these schedules. We've gone through them um, quite a bit, but I will go to the final schedule. Um, which just talks about the impact to uh, individual homeowners. This is the 2013 proposed tax levy ordinance as discussed on November 18th. It no longer includes the proposed additional amount of 580,000. So it is um, just the tax cap and the new growth and the change in the bond debt service levy. So the total tax levy is an adjustment of 2.82% over the extended levy last year. And based on uh, current projections of equalized assessed valuation and the proposed tax levy, uh, it is projected that a average homeowner, a home of $800,000 market value, would see an increase in the city portion of the property tax bill of $86. So I'd be happy to answer any questions related to either ordinance. Questions for Elizabeth? When, when people are watching this, <clears throat> and they see their tax bill go up by more than $86 next year. Just 
for the record, that's not going to be because we made mistakes here. That's because the assessments are higher and the other taxing bodies have taxed more. Because right. Um, this portion, portion is of our only the city and library. So the city represents about 19.7% of the total. The library represents 2.8. So we combine for about 22% of the total tax bill. Individual assessments will vary. Um, individual property assessments may go up or down, which impact um, the overall tax bill to that particular property. So, thank you. Any questions for Elizabeth? Anyone in the public that would like to make a comment or question this? If not, I think we need two separate motions, uh, for one for each ordinance. Uh, we need one to grant final approval of an ordinance restating and reaffirming ordinance number 2008-08. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Roll call vote, please, Biddy. Alderman Novit. Aye. Alderman Waldeck. Aye. Alderman Moore. Aye. Alderman Pandeleon. Aye. Alderman Tack. Aye. Alderman Reisenberg. Aye. Alderman Palmer. Aye. Alderman Edelman. Aye. Eight yay, zero nay, motion carries. Thank you, Biddy. Now we need a motion to grant final approval of an ordinance establishing the 2013 tax levy. Do I have a motion? So moved. moved. Second. Biddy, roll call vote, please. Alderman Novit. Aye. Alderman Waldeck. Aye. Alderman Moore. Aye. Alderman Pandeleon. Aye. Alderman Tack. Aye. Alderman Reisenberg. Aye. Alderman Palmer. Aye. Alderman Edelman. Aye. Eight yay, zero nay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda, also with Elizabeth, approval of an ordinance is abating 2013 tax levies for various general obligation alternate revenue bond issues. This is an item also uh, receiving first reading approval on November 18th, now subject to final reading and final approval. Um, this relates to the debt service portion of the tax levy. Um, the city um, levies all our city issues all debt as general obligation debt so it initially goes on the tax bill um, annually the city um, adopts abatement ordinances to reduce um, the debt service tax levy by those bonds that are intended to be funded from alternate revenue sources so the schedule here shows the gross levy um, for each bond issue and then the source of funding by bond issue from the different revenue sources cemetery operations golf operations water operations um, the half a percent sales tax and an interest rebate from the federal government um, bringing us to our net debt service levy that is intended to be funded from property taxes so there are four separate abatement ordinances um, related to the 2010 and 2011 bond issues that have abatements associated with them questions for Elizabeth on this one uh, anyone from the public if not, I'd ask for a motion to approve and grant final approval of the ordinances abating tax levies for various general obligation bond issues. Is this for all four? Can we do that all at once? Yes. Uh, I move that we uh, approve the four ordinances abating uh, the tax levy for debt service. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, roll call vote, please. Alderman Novit. Aye. Alderman <clears throat> Waldeck. Aye. Alderman Moore? Aye. Alderman Pandeleon? Aye. Alderman Tack? Aye. Alderman Reisenberg? Aye. Alderman Palmer? Aye. Alderman Edelman? Aye. Eight yay, zero nay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And Elizabeth, we're not going to let you go quite yet. Next item on the agenda, consideration of an ordinance approving a fee schedule, ordinances adopting new fees related to sanitation, parks and recreation, electric vehicle charging station, and landscape licensing and an ordinance amending city code to authorize the city manager authority in administering fees. And this would be final approval. Elizabeth? Um, this package of six separate ordinances all related to fees um, in fiscal year 15 uh, also received first reading approval November 18th. Um, the first is an ordinance approving the fee schedule for FY15. It includes an exhibit that shows in yellow any fees that are proposed to change in orange any new fees proposed the four new fees all are approved by separate ordinances for the, so those four ordinances are included in the packet those four new fees um, are the first the sanitation fee um, the sanitation fee was proposed in october by the public works committee and recommended for approval it would be one dollar <coughs> per pickup uh, with collection twice a week 
and four weeks per month. The fee is $8 per month. It is proposed that the fee would be collected as a $24 quarterly charge on the account's water bill. This would generate annual revenue of $620,000. I guess, and this is not a big thing, but um, when we go to dollar per pickup, could we just say $8 per month? Sure. Because there's going to be some odd months where there's a ninth. Uh, it, it just doesn't make sense. I also think that's important because I don't want to, we shouldn't send the message that you could somehow uh, change your service and not pay a dollar per pickup. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't yeah. we agree to or that? Or not put your garbage out. Didn't we agree to that at the last meeting? We did, but so. it's still, the, the, the graphic still identifies yeah. it as you know, a dollar it, per pickup. Right. It makes out about the same, but it should be eight a month. Right. And Actually, what we I meant that, you could, that we could opt out. I must, I must have missed that. You did miss that. I, I yeah, did use that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> what we did here was try to delineate how we got to $8 a month, but the ordinance actually indicates $8 per Eight month. month. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the other three new fees that are proposed by ordinance in this package is uh, one submitted by Parks and Recreation for watercraft sand storage fees, uh, one from the Office of City Manager for an electric vehicle charging station fee, and another from the Office of the City Manager for a landscape license application penalty for late submission. As part of the city's annual budget development, as noted, the fee schedule also proposed certain adjustments to existing fees. Um, these include eliminating the online vehicle sticker discount, annual adjustments of parks, recreation, and golf fees, clarification and simplification of the building, building permit fee schedule and other incidental changes as indicated and highlighted on the exhibit A to the fee schedule ordinance. And the final ordinance submitted as part of this packet is one that is a code change um, providing um, authority to the city manager to more effectively administer collection of the city's revenues. It would provide the city manager specific authority to waive or reduce fees and to establish appropriate means of payment for specific <laughs> fees and charges. The authority to reduce and waive fees would be limited to $5,000 unless approved by city council and any reduction or waiver that exceeds $1,000 would be reported to the finance committee as an informational item. So those six ordinances are submitted uh, as a packet under this item. Questions for Elizabeth on these? Uh, anyone from the public? If not, I'll look for a motion to grant final approval to the proposed ordinances. And so move for approval of the uh, ordinances. Second. Roll call vote, please. <coughs> Alderman Novit? Aye. Alderman Waldeck? Aye. Alderman Moore? Aye. Alderman Pandelion? Aye. Alderman Tack? Aye. Alderman Reisenberg? Aye. Alderman Palmer? Aye. Alderman Edelman? Aye. Eight yeas, zero nay. Motion carries. Thank you, Betty, very much. Any other comments from the council? Hearing none, we'll move on. Opportunity for the citizens to address uh, the city council on non-agenda items. Anyone care to do so? Seeing no one. Next item on the agenda, items for omnibus vote consideration. There are quite a few this evening. There are 10. I will read them all. If any council member wishes to take any of them separately, we'll do so at the end. Otherwise, I'll ask for a motion for all the approval of such. Uh, item number one, approval of the November 18, 2013 City Council Minutes. Number two, the check register. Number three, award of a contract for professional services consultation on the purchase of the new parks and recreation software. Number four, authorization to dispose of city property. Number five, award of bid for the water plant pony boiler and water heater improvement project. Number six, consideration request to waive the bidding process and purchase a VertiFlow recirculation pump from Pump Supply Incorporated. Number seven, ratify approval of Gordon, Gordon Community Center budget. Number eight, consideration of an ordinance approving a recommendation from the Building Review Board. This would be first reading and if desired by the council, final approval. Number nine, consideration of an ordinance approving a recommendation from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Again, first reading and if desired by the city council, final approval. And number 10, approval of a resolution supporting the retrofit of existing DOT 111 rail tank cars the transport packaging groups one and two hazmat before the pipelines and hazardous materials safety administration in docket number PHMSA-2012-0082. 
Any of those items want to be taken separately? If not, I'll look for a roll call or a motion to approve the omnibus. I actually have two, two questions. Um, on item number three, the park and rec software, I could I just would like an, an idea of what this software does well the software is in place right now and maybe Elizabeth you can uh, go up and address it we currently have software for all the registration online registration and so forth <coughs> and it's to a point where it can't be serviced anymore and so before we just go out and either update the current system or buy a new one basically this is bringing in a third-party consultant to work with us to identify what our needs are so we can better approach what the uh, the appropriate software package is to meet those needs Okay, thank you. I mean, I, they were just really, the description didn't really explain what the <clears throat> software did. So, I, um, And then my uh, second question is on item number 10, the rail car, uh, um, uh, whatever it is, uh, <laughs> mo motion or? Uh, yeah, I can. I'm maybe. not quite sure where that <laughs> came from. I yeah, got actually, that, that, that came from surprise. That came from me, George. Um, okay. <laughs> Several mayors uh, throughout the country, we're part of the Mayor's Caucus, several mayors throughout the state, rather, uh, have been actively involved, uh, President Darsh and Barrington, Mayor Wisner and Aurora, in lobbying for some added safety features on these rail tank cars. There have been uh, several instances, a couple in particular with rail car derailments, that have been significantly serious hazardous material issues. And uh, some of these, well, particularly the older rail cars, um, are not really in compliance from a safety standpoint. So this is a resolution supporting the effort to try to bring those cars into compliance and the new cars to make sure that they are in compliance. And actually, uh, we had a mayor's caucus meeting a couple weeks ago, and, and the railroads are actually very much in support of this. Uh, so it is really a public safety issue, and it's an opportunity for the council to restate that. And this, these standards are from 1991. Yep. And here we are in 2013. And what percentage of <coughs> it's the role? Well, I guess these cars last a long time. They do last a long time, but there have been several instances with very significant yeah. uh, issues. And certainly, we have more than our share of those cars running through our community every day. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd just like to follow up, I guess, to Elizabeth on the. Uh, software for uh, parks and rec um, we we just paid a accounting firm one-seventh of that fee to help us determine and it's a uh, Wolfen company they're a relatively good accounting firm I would hope um, you know to, to help us find a one and a half million dollar new ERP system for our company and that was five thousand dollars for that, for that kind of help and determination. So how much is the software going to cost if the consulting fee to pick the software is 35000 Or did I hear that wrong? Um, $35,000, yes. Um, the software or the consulting fee to help find the software? This is the consulting to help find the software. So this will be a needs assessment with the various divisions of the Parks and Recreation Department assistance in developing the uh, system requirements and the RFP, and then the actual assistance in reviewing the proposals and vendor selection. So that's what's included in the 35 It just seems extraordinary, huge amount of money, because there's obviously canned programs out there that are going to come in with their dog and pony show in the top four by calling people in Highland Park. I, I don't mean to get too granular here, but it, right. it's... It's so much more than than we would spend or have spent on great big systems. So I don't really know. Um, I, did, I just want to say that, I guess. If it carries any traction with the council, that's up to yeah, the rest of them. It just seems like a lot of money. Out to RFP, we did get three responses. You can see that we got one that was twice that. So it was very right. interesting. It was difficult for us as a committee to have such a wide range of proposals. So we actually had client first take a look at it. They said that had they proposed, it would have been somewhere in the middle. So they they would have actually proposed higher than the 35,000 but not as high as the 77. It's just peculiar to me and I'm right. just one data point. So I yep. mean it may yep. have something to do with the specifications of the RFP which may have been much more elaborate Broad than, base. you know, um, 
whether that was necessary or not is another question, but I'm not, I don't think we want to get into. I, I don't either. I just, you uh, know, scrutinizing RFPs at right. that level. So. Well, David raises a good point. And what's the magnitude of the software conceivably that we would buy? And by the way, I've used the REC software and it's pretty cumbersome. So we yeah. do need new software. But I mean, what's the, magn the dollar magnitude of what we could spend on a new system? Well, it's hard to say because I'm sure that there, we're going to see a wide range of pricing. I know when we did the financial system in Highland Park, our ranges were, we had almost nearly a million dollars in range between the proposals. So mm. it really depends on what type of software you, you buy. One thing that attracted us to Plant Moran is in the interview with the selection committee, they talked about how they really try to minimize customization and do as much out of the box and, and as little customization as possible because they think that that's the lowest cost in the long run for you. And that was something that, that I think um, was a, a big selling point for the selection committee and that we thought that that was a good, um, good tack to take for the <clears throat> consultant. So. so change your administrative processes to suit the software exactly. versus forcing the software to be changed so that your administrative processes don't have to. Yeah, right, yeah. right. So. Well, I would say to Elizabeth's credit, uh, and much to the chagrin of some of the department heads, is that she's instituted this process because I think, um, and I won't name any specific applications that we have, but it might be more like, I saw this at a conference and it looks nice <laughs> and I think will meet our needs and it gets implemented and it doesn't necessarily meet our needs. Here we're trying to do the needs assessment first so we don't overbuy or get a software package that a year, three years is clunky or cumbersome or doesn't do things that we'd like for it to do. So at least we go into it. Maybe we're spending a little more money up front, but hopefully we'll save it in spades down the road because I think the current software we have, and it's what, 10 years old, eight years old, that was $350,000 or something? Yeah, I'm close to that, yeah. Yeah. Anything else? If not, I need a motion to approve the omnibus. So moved. I have a second. Second. Roll call vote, please, Biddy. Alderman Novit? Aye. Alderman Waldeck? Aye. Alderman Moore? Aye. Alderman Pandeleon? Aye. Alderman Tack? Aye. Alderman Reisenberg? Aye. Alderman Palmer? Aye. Alderman Edelman? Aye. Eight yay, zero nay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda, ordinances. I don't know if we have any more. I don't think so. All right. Uh, next item on the agenda, new business. Uh, go, I need a motion to go into executive session to consider approval and release of executive session minutes. So I need a motion for adjournment into executive session. Move to adjourn. Second. A second. Uh, roll call vote. Alderman Novit. Aye. Alderman Waldeck. Aye. Alderman, Aye. Alderman Moore. Aye. Alderman Pandeleon. Aye. Alderman Tack. Aye. Alderman Reisenberg. Aye. Alderman Palmer. Aye. Alderman Edelman. Aye. Adjourn into executive session. Thank you, Biddy. We will return in probably five or ten minutes. We are in executive.